It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome into an episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. A little bit different location in the background there, Alan. Uh, up at the Indianapolis for the Combine this week. I would say that this is like... We're kind of past the dead period time now. I mean, you know, things are about to really start ramping up. This is when people really start getting excited for the NFL draft. Obviously, you had the Senior Bowl, which is where the draft starts. But, like, now we're really getting into the time where people get excited. Free agency right around the corner. Alan, how are we doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. We've been in Indy since last night. Me, myself, Nick Farabaugh, uh, Joe Smeltzer from Nittany Sports Now. There's a whole herd of Nittany Lions here. So, Joe's joining Mm -hmm. us. And then uh, Derek Bell. I will be driving up on Wednesday, so we'll have the whole crew here. Very excited. Um, You know, I love the Combine. I I love this week here in Indy. It's a great town, a great event town, one of the best event towns in the country. And so I'm I'm fired up about being here. I already have, like, my DMs full of people that are trying to connect and, you know, trying to talk to agents or, you know, uh, people that are connected to players and and all kinds of stuff, and I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I think that's interesting because it was there was some talk about it not being in Indy, right? Like it got extended to be yeah, there. Dude, I, man, I really I hope it stays here forever. I, I can't imagine like just the way that Indianapolis is set up, right? So maybe I can like I don't know if, if you can like bring up a map or something, but like it's so most of the stuff that we do, like the interviews and the um the bench press and all the team player interviews are done at a building called the Indianapolis in the Indiana Convention Center, which is just this huge convention center building. And it is connected to Lucas Oil Stadium through like a walkway and a tunnel. So it's like across the street and up the hill from Lucas Oil Stadium. And then, so the on-field drills are at Lucas Oil Stadium. All the off-field stuff, like the interviews, the testing, all that stuff happens at the Indiana Convention Center. And then all the teams are staying in these hotels that are downtown. All the players are staying in these hotels that are downtown. And they're all connected to the convention center by indoor walkway. So you literally never have to, like, go outside. Even though it's beautiful today in Indianapolis for the first time ever. Like, it's February in, the, like, middle America. It's usually blustery, snowy, cold, whatever. Gross. It was, like, 65 and sunny today. But, like, you, all, you never have to go outside. All these places are connected. And then all the great restaurants and bars – of downtown Indianapolis are right in the same area. So it's, it's like I parked my car today and I probably will not move it again for the rest of the week. Like it is just a great area. Um, everything happens in the same little space. So I think the best part about the combine is not only is it convenient in terms of like, you know, it, everything's centrally located right here in downtown, but also everybody's staying here. So you go out to the bar and you'll see, a general manager sitting at the table next to you and you'll see agents and you'll see players. And uh, I told my story about Bailey Zappi, right. Uh, you know, running into him on the street late at night uh, in Indianapolis and uh, him getting ethered by somebody's grandma. Uh, you, you know, like th- those are the kind of things that only happen when you're in this compact place where everybody's in the same place at the same time. And that's what makes the combine great. And I hope it stays here forever. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I just hear so many people express that same sentiment. And I know the NBA All-Star Game was in Indiana this year, and there was, like, a lot of talk about that and people saying that, you know, the league felt like they didn't it didn't necessarily go that way. They changed the parameters for the hosting cities basically immediately after having the event there. So they were like, does the NBA feel like that wasn't a good spot after doing it? That's a completely different type of thing anyway. But, yeah, like, I, I can't imagine it being anywhere else besides Indianapolis at this point. Like, it just feels like that's the way it should be well so many like so few places have like the combination of stuff that indiana has where you have an indoor stadium right it needs to be indoors because it's in february Mm -hmm. okay and then it's uh it's it's right downtown you know it's not like out in the middle of nowhere where you have all these hotels and you have the convention center and you have all the restaurants and the bars that are all right there adjacent to the building like maybe minneapolis maybe atlanta but like i don't know where their Mm -hmm. second like event facility would be, I guess it, and I guess Atlanta could do it in Phillips Arena, which is kind of right across from Mercedes Benz Stadium. But um, it's difficult. It's difficult to have that much space, and the indoor football facility 
and have like a place that has enough hotel rooms where all these people want to be in close proximity with, with one another. I don't know. I, I can't ever really imagine it being anywhere else. I assume that at some point the league will try it, but I, I think it's a mistake. I, I hope it stays here forever. Let me see if if this would be uh, share my screen and see if this is this like, is like a uh, depiction here. Can you tell yeah. that at all? If yeah, so so right, exactly. So um, if you kind of like look at what the Indiana Convention Center, and there's that gray building like a little bit across the street to the right, um, mm -hmm. that's where. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's it's in blue A. Blue A, that's the Crown Plaza Hotel. That's where all the players are staying. So they're right there. Um, the okay, so the blues are the hotel, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so the mm -hmm. teams are in all these hotels that are in the downtown area. So, like uh across the street from the convention center, there's a Hyatt Regency, there's the Conrad where the Steelers stay, there's the Hilton, there's all these other hotels. And then down at the end of that row is the JW Marriott, which is where like every agent in America is currently posted up at. Uh, it's where all the like ESPN and NFL Network people are. Uh, and so uh, all these hotels are all connected by those blue walkways where you know everything's indoors, everything's connected, yeah. and you don't have to drive. Like all these people want to get out and drink and socialize and meet people, and you know, nobody has to drink and drive, nobody has to get an Uber, it's all walkable. You know, every great restaurant in Indianapolis is within this square that you're looking at right here. And so it makes it for a really awesome, uh, really, really awesome place. And uh, I, I love it here. Um, Alan, a lot of the talk this week is going to be about the combine with you being there. But you sent me a question that you had gotten from somebody. And I thought it was very interesting. We can kind of have a conversation off that and parlay that into whatever. But uh, Jonas said, when you watch all the drills and such, do you find yourself getting more invested in some players? And are you able to be objective all the way? Also, any players you are extra excited to watch? So, you know, I think that that on the on the surface is a great question, but then like you start to think even deeper than that and just like the evaluation process in itself, not just for the, the combine. Yeah. Also, you're underselling this question, too, because Jonas is Jonas. I mean, I'm going to give it a shot here, Jonas. Elifsrud from Norway. Uh, yes. So, I mean, first of all, shout out to Jonas for listening <laughs> yes. in Norway. Um, yeah, that's absolutely. awesome. Love that. Uh Second of all, uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting question about just like my sort of process for watching players and, and evaluating the draft. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a question because I am and, – and Jonas had a follow-up question here too that I'll read uh, that said, uh, are there positions you watch more than others? Are they linked to the Steelers or a more general approach? Thanks all of your stuff. Yeah, I'm totally only really trying to evaluate for what the Steelers are going to do, what the Steelers might do. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not watching, you know, like May and Williams this week, for example. Like I don't care. I'm not going to spend any time doing it. Um, I don't I know. know. Uh, Merrill mm -hmm. Hodge said Drake May, not a first rounder. I love Merrill. <laughs> that seems bonkers. I think I would take Drake May over Caleb Williams personally. Um, this starts for me by watching a lot of college football, as much college football as I can. I love college football. I do it not because I'm doing it, because I'm obsessed with the draft but because I just love to watch college football and I'm going to watch it anyway. So I think it starts with a baseline familiarity of who these people are, what they were like as college players, um, where, you know, just, just having an idea of who the players are. Like I already know because I watch college football, like who, who's going to be here next year. Like I can already give you like 20 names of people that I'd be looking forward to seeing here next year because of what I've seen from college football. So that's the first start. And then, and then, then, you know, like about the senior bowl, before we get to the senior bowl, I try to familiarize myself with some of the players that I'm going to see there um, and really try to watch some tape. Um, try to watch at least one game or like a good cut up of a game um, to see, like to really get a feel about a person. And then I, I try to go into this process with an open mind. Like I have sort of preconceived notions about people, but I think you have to be willing to let your mind be changed by what you see throughout this process. Like, it's not like I have like years of experience watching, you know, a guy that I, I should be so like set in my ways. Um, so I think you have to be open. Uh, I, I try to be open about what I see. I try to let what I see influence me. I think 
that's a that's an important part of this process, right? Is the teams really are influenced by things like the senior bowl, things like the combine. You should have strong priors, but you should let yourself be influenced by what you see because the teams are going to be. And they think it's important. So I should think it's important. And, you know, so I think that's – you end up with your favorites. You end up with your guys that you're going to be higher on than the league, than the rest of the draft community, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, that doesn't I, that doesn't mean I'm not objective about those people, but there will definitely be you know players that I'll I, I think that I will think are better than everybody else does, and there will be players that I think that I will think are worse than everybody else does. So like I'm really uh, after the Senior Bowl, you know, I don't think I've made it any secret that I'm not a big fan of Bo Nix or, or Michael Penix, and that I don't think either right. are going to be particularly good NFL starting quarterbacks based on what I've seen. I kind of had that opinion of them going into. The senior bowl was certainly mm-hmm. more than confirmed that opinion, right? Like they were, they were even worse than I thought they would be. And so um, I think that, I think it's also important in this process to kind of be aware of what you don't know, right? Like anyone that really thinks they have a really good scouting report on JJ McCarthy, I think, I think you're full of crap. Like, I don't think anybody really knows how good he is. He hasn't played enough. And when he did play, he didn't play against very good competition and he wasn't asked to do very much. I don't think anybody really knows how good he's going to be. Like there are some players like Amarius Mims from Georgia. Like I can sit there and I've probably probably watched every snap he took except for like some FCS games. But like, that doesn't mean I know everything about him. Like he's a mystery. Like so much of this is still at the end of the day, a projection. That's why even though these teams are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to evaluate draft prospects, they still get it wrong all the time because there's only so much information out there. That, that you can glean like the rest of it is still just a projection it's still just a guess at the end of the day and um and i'm trying to figure out what the steelers are going to do i think that's that's really my i want to rank them based on how i feel about them you know within but i'm really only going to pay attention to those positions i think the steelers are going to be interested in yeah see i watch guys regardless of Steelers interest to be honest with you and I like college football I'm definitely nowhere near as with you are like I don't watch film on guys until probably like right around this time of year at least after the NFL season ends I'll start to download I'm subscribed to or I I pay for a Patreon subscription to Caddy's Cutups and that's how I get uh, the film on these guys but last year I watched 129 players uh at least one game 83 of those were two games uh on guys and there's just yeah there's there's guys that stand out to me uh both positively and negatively if it's in a positive way i actually dig a little bit deeper than if it's in a negative way um just for reassurance for myself um but yeah i i i'm interested in in the combine stuff and like the stock that's put into it uh because there's always that debate too right like i think that that's what you mentioned or we're at least alluding to with like the teams do definitely put stock into it because people will be like oh it means nothing you know you're talking about guys running in, in underwear 40 times and stuff like that like it means absolutely nothing i mean if it meant absolutely nothing they wouldn't be doing these things yeah, no, it's it's definitely meaningful. It's it's specifically, I think, meaningful for certain guys, certain positions, you know, certain situations. I think it's not meaningful for everyone. Right? There was a report today that um, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is not going to do anything. He's not going to run. Yeah, he's not going to run here. He's not going to run his pro day. He's not going to do drills. And like some of these guys, I think, get some pretty wonky advice. But like, look at his situation. Like that guy's a top five pick. If he does nothing, the whole rest of the process. Like, what does he have to gain? Um, what does Caleb Williams have to gain, really? I mean, I, I don't really – I can understand some of them. Some of these guys really need to run, though. I mean, if you're a guy like Quinnon Mitchell, right, who's a guy that we've been talking yeah. about with the Steelers, right, a corner from Toledo, like the Senior Bowl was really important for him, right, because he had never played against Power 5 competition, all his tapes from Toledo, and, and Toledo didn't really play that lot of many games against against mm-hmm. our teams. Like, even for a max school, they didn't play that many. And so – the, like the senior bowl is hugely important for him to see him go against big name receivers and, and see how he did. And now you know, he'll have to run well, but I think like for him specifically, maybe this isn't as important as the senior bowl was. Now let's look at another guy, another first round corner, like Ennis Rakestraw from Missouri. Like here's a guy who's coming off injury, right? Lower body injury. Yep. So like if he runs and I'm not sure that he is, uh, but if he runs and he runs well, I think that's a big money maker for him. Now he's already played against good receivers, so like we didn't need to see him at the Senior Bowl, right? He played in the SEC, some of the best receivers in the country. You want to go see him play against Malik Neighbors? You can go see it. But uh, you know, will he run well? And has he recovered from that injury? Like that's a big question mark for him. So I think it means different things for different guys, different positions. I think there are certain positions where you gain 
fairly little out of the combine. Um, you know, I, I like we're talking a lot about center for the Steelers. I, I don't really know what I expect to learn about the center prospects for the Steelers at the combine. It's good for me because they get to meet some of them that I haven't met before. Um, you know, I'll get to you know, be face to face with Graham Barton. And I do think for me, that's an important part of the process. Um, I think I've told the story before, but you know, the infamous S2 test with, uh, with CJ Stroud yeah. last year and how like that was the reason that a lot of people were saying, you know, Brian, let's take young over him. And, I had met CJ Stroud at the Heisman ceremony the year that uh, Pickett was a semifinalist and I had interviewed him for a while. And I, I knew that he was not dumb. Like I, I like when you meet a guy and you talk to him, like you kind of get a sense like, Oh, is this an intelligent person? Like it doesn't really take that long. You do it in your own life every day. I'm sure where you meet someone, you're like, Oh, is this guy know what he's talking about? Is this guy full crap? Is this guy a knucklehead? Like it's, it's, mm -hmm. you can fake it for a little bit. And I'm sure some of these guys do, but some of them also don't fake it. Some of them are knuckleheads and it's pretty clear. And so I think um, that it's, that that's illuminating for me. I think that if, if you, if you have a good evaluation of a guy like last year, when I talked uh, you know, Broderick Jones, right. I think like everybody had seen the tape. Uh, everyone was aware of what the issues were and what the, what the potential was. I think when you meet a guy and it kind of lines up with what you see or you have a good feeling about his character or his person, I think that helps the evaluation. And obviously the teams are doing a much more in-depth part of that process than I am. Um, but I think, you know, like when you see a guy where maybe the tape doesn't match the stock, right, where you're like, oh, he looks great on tape, but nobody has him rated very highly what's wrong mm -hmm. then for me i'm trying to figure out okay well what is it did he get in trouble is there an injury problem is he is he a jerk right is he lazy uh is he gonna be overweight right or is he too small you know like a lot of colleges lie about the heights and weights so like for example chop robinson's guy falling down draft boards was talked about as the top 20 pick now he's probably closer to 40 or 50 from penn state well he's not a very big guy i mean that's evident by the tape and then you look at the way he's listed and you're like oh okay well he's listed at like 6 1 2 50 or something like that well if he turns out to be like 5 11 2 20 then he's not draftable as a, as a defensive end like for a, a down lineman team like and so like how the how players measure height and weight will be impactful for some you know, not everything is important for everything. There are definitely lots of guys who this process won't matter for at all, but it definitely is a, it, it's, it's, I learned so much at these things. And really for me, another big part of this is just talking to other people in the NFL landscape. Like I'm going to run into guys. I know guys that were assistant coaches, maybe that I covered before that are now in different organization, a scout. I know uh, who's changed jobs or maybe is from Pittsburgh. Right. And I'll reconnect with an agent, mm -hmm. a, a, a player's, uh, you know, someone who works for a player, right, a trainer or or a PR staff and sharing my opinions about people and getting other opinions back. That's like an important part of this process. Like you feel out, OK, what does the league think about this person? And you kind of get that consensus perspective. If I go talk to an agent, I go talk to an assistant coach that I've worked with before and I go talk to a scout and we all talk about the same player and I share what I think and they share what with me what they think. That can tell me, oh, well, I was on the right track, or maybe, hey, the league thinks differently about this guy than you do, and here's why. I think that's for me one of the most valuable parts of this process, probably more so than like actually watching the drills or watching the guys run. Um, I'll take the numbers, but I don't actually need to see that happen. For me, the other, the rest of this is more important. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing that you mentioned in terms of like the way guys can like rise or fall or like not matching uh the the tape like for me and these aren't guys that were like at the top that's oh actually the, the watch team i'm gonna bring up was but like uh when, watching florida state guys renardo green the corner i really liked but like people are looking at him as like a day three guy i I like him higher than that based off the film so i'm curious as to if there's something there with like the medicals or how he's gonna run or the size like what is the reason that he's gonna fall and the other is keon coleman who like at the beginning of the college football season at least through the first couple of weeks he was like right in that conversation after Martin Harris, Marvin Harrison Jr. with like Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors. And it doesn't seem like that's the case at all. Like even Brian Thomas Jr., the other LSU receivers ahead of him, uh, Donna Mitchell out of Texas. Like what is the reason in your opinion? Like I don't know where you felt like those guys were based off the film, but like is there a reason besides that that you think that those guys have fallen? I think with Coleman, it's, it's like not a long – 
history of production. Like, I think that's one of it, right? And it's not like it's not like he had. I mean, you kind of lose the last half of the season, right? After Jordan Travis gets hurt, like they kind of, yeah, like, you know, everything sort of falls apart for Florida State, and, and the offense ends up with a lot of touchdowns, but not really that many yards. So I think like the skill looks there, but the production doesn't quite match up, and so that's probably a a, a flag. Um, you know, guy, teams are going to want to know like why did a guy transfer? Like what you know, what was he? What was he running from or to? You know, I think the transfer portal is something that the NFL QB plus has, has had to deal with. <laughs> But I think a lot of NFL people are still uncomfortable with guys that like transfer for specific reasons. Like if you're trying to get out of competition, like I, I think that's a big red flag for the NFL. Like if if you didn't want to compete with a guy for your job and you left for that reason, I think that's um, mm-hmm. that that's a negative. And so I don't know why Keon Coleman transferred to, from Michigan State to Florida State, but I, I think he's an interesting guy that like if he runs well at his size, like I rem- like. Like Chase Claypool is a bigger guy. And I don't even think he's mm-hmm. as big as you know Coleman, but he was a bigger guy. And then he ran what he ran. All of a sudden, like he got talked about a lot differently in that draft class. Yeah. So I think well, that's, a, that's an interesting thing because people were talking about like is Keon Coleman a tight end? People were making that same conversations with Chase yeah. Claypool. Well, if he goes out and runs like a four three something like Chase Claypool did, then I think that'll be the end of that conversation. Right. Um yeah. I also think you know, certain teams are probably more willing to tolerate a non-typical body style than others. Some teams are very regimented in like what they want and what they look for. Mm. Steelers, I think, are yeah. one of those teams at wide receiver where they have like specific molds that they're trying to fit guys into. Other teams really don't care. So it's not the same evaluation for everyone. And you know, I'm certainly you know, going to try to make a holistic evaluation of a player, but I'm, I'm mostly interested in what the Steelers are going to do and how it impacts them. So I haven't really looked at first-round wide receivers that hard – because I don't sure, think that's yeah. for the Steelers. Um, maybe even like like some of the guys I like are, are probably more like second rounds. Also, I think the Steelers probably need a slot more than they need a guy who's 6'4. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so we'll see. But I think the Arthur Smith hire probably pushed wide receiver farther down my board than it already was uh, just because the, he doesn't use his wide receivers very often. If you look at Atlanta last year, his top five targets were two tight ends and a running back and you know yes yeah along it with probably the- also kind of gave you better parameters in terms of the wide receiver that you are looking for yeah i mean i i think so i think you need somebody that can block first and foremost like i think that's yeah. gonna be a big yeah. part of it i also wonder like what you know if they're like I, I think that's to me that feels like a free agency position for the steelers like i just think that they'll find somebody um mm-hmm. You know that they can they can fit with Pickens and Johnson and I, I don't know they draft it really well so I'll, I'll never ignore it but I'm focused yeah. on other places right now primarily you know we talked about those needs I'm I'm not sure I listed wide receiver I, if they cut Allen Robinson it will certainly be a need but um, yeah uh, it's not the top for me right absolutely so with that in mind at the combine are there like certain guys that you kind of have circled um or like is it because there's so many guys there it's just such a broad range of players you'll just take it as they come so i mean i want to know more about the guys i know least about so like we have our draft board you can check it out steelersnow.com we just published it today um and basically Mm -hmm. Right now, it's kind of like an unranked. It is ranked. It's just ranked by the NFL mock draft average. So it's not our ranking. It's just like sort of generically placed. But it's every player from the Shrine Bowl, every player from the Senior Bowl, and every player at the Combine. So that's a pretty deep prospect pool, right? And, and you know, yeah. so you can kind of see like where the players that we've written about are on that list. Like you can kind of get a feel for like, okay, so for example, quarterback, right? Well, I mean, I don't know where the Steelers are going to look at quarterback, but uh, we got JJ. Uh, we, we talked to Bo Nix at the Senior Bowl. We talked to Michael Penix at the Senior Bowl. We talked to Michael Pratt and Spencer Rattler at the Senior Bowl. Like we didn't get to talk to Jordan Travis, so like I feel like that's a guy that I, I kind of want to want to you know have a conversation with. JJ McCarthy uh, didn't get to talk to because he wasn't at the Senior Bowl. Okay, that's a guy I want to have a conversation with. Um, at tackle, okay, uh, I talked to Talia Sifuaga. Nick talked to Tyler Guyton at the Senior Bowl. You know, let's fill in that middle. Let's talk to J.C. Latham. Let's talk to Marius Mims. Let's talk to Troy Fatano. You know, so the guys I have more experience with, I probably will pay less attention to this week. I ha- I feel like I have a good idea of who Talia Sifuaga is and what he's all about. Um, like center, okay. Like I, I feel like a very good grasp on Jackson Powers Johnson after we saw him live at the Senior Bowl and interviewed him. 
Um, Zach Frazier, I haven't talked to. I watched him play live this year. I got to cover West Virginia games, so I feel a little bit better about him than probably the rest of these guys. But like Cedric Van Pran and Graham Barton, comparatively, I have a lot less experience with. So those are, I'm going to focus more on the guys I have less hands-on experience with and probably less on the guys I've already written or just evaluated a lot on my own. Gotcha. Okay. Hmm. Alan, I don't know if I have any other questions that popped in my mind there about the combine. Unless you have something else. Are there maybe some guys that you're just looking forward to hearing about or you think that... I'm happy, well, not for the Steelers specifically, but I'm very intrigued, especially because of what you mentioned about Marvin not running, that Roma Dunze is, because I think he's going to fly. Um, Yeah. I think the, the Steelers should be rooting for some fast wide receivers because I think guys <laughs> like Holman and Brian Thomas, um, they're sort of like a, above or below the Steelers in the first round, like could kind of could go either way, right? Like they could easily be in the yeah. 20s. They could easily, if they run well, get up into the teens. I think the Steelers should be rooting for some fast times to get those guys up into Troy Franklin from Oregon, probably in the same uh, vein. Yes. If they get yeah. some fast times those guys could move up ahead of the Steelers and push uh, some of these other guys down. I'm very interested in the cornerbacks because I think um, that might be the position where I see the least consensus. I think I've seen Terry and Arnold, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Mm -hmm. Nate Wiggins, Cooper DeGene, Quinion Mitchell, kind of all as like different outlets think are the best corner in this class. And I think different outlets all have them have – a certain one of them available to the Steelers at 20. And it just depends. What do you think right now? I think I like Terry and Arnold the best. And I think probably nice. Quinion Mitchell next. And then yeah. I'm not sure that I have a strong opinion. I haven't seen mm-hmm. enough of Wiggins, um, which is weird. Cause usually I get the ACC guys nailed down because of covering pit, but I just didn't see enough of him. And then DeGene is all about the medical. I don't know. Like, how healthy is he? How healthy is he going to be? Is it a long-term thing? Is it- I also just have trouble listing him just as a corner. Like, I think there's going to be a lot of teams that like him at safety and, like, want to use him in different ways. So, like, I don't know. That's why I haven't even listed him as a corner. I think he's probably a corner, an inside-out corner. Um, I okay. think he can play kind of everywhere. I, I don't really th- – I do, too. I, I, I'm not yeah. the kind of – like, nickel is so valuable that I don't understand, like, writing off, like, players – as like mm-hmm. slot guys like I, that's fine by me like go go be a slot guy i don't care like that's yeah the Quinion and mitchell might be a slot guy like I, I don't know he's certainly like fast enough to not have to be but if you put him in the right situation he could do that really well so i, I like why I, I don't have a problem with that and, and having joey porter jr i think gives the steelers a good amount of flexibility to let their other corner be a different body type there aren't too many teams that have a like two DK Metcalfs, right, that are just going to, like, run you down with two gigantic wide receivers that you need to have an answer for. That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. often. So I think um, I think I like Arnold the best. I think Mitchell probably next. And then I'm kind of unsure about where I have the other three. So that's probably a big, big thing for me this week um, is is finding out – more about those corners i think that i think that's a group where you could see a lot of movement and and maybe a lot of i think we've already seen a lot of movement right like greg straw probably lower now than he was before his injury Corey lassiter is a guy that what was being talked about as a first round pick that i don't see anymore Keelan king is a guy mm-hmm. that's being talked about as a first round pick that I yeah was like fourth rounder now uh, and on the other side i think there's some guys that maybe don't have ideal size but are coming up like mike sandra still from michigan just kind of started mm-hmm. this process as like maybe a day three pick. Now I think like maybe he doesn't even make it to the Steelers in the second round. Um, Max Melton's a guy who's been rising for some reason. I didn't think he had a great senior bowl. I'll probably try to circle back mm-hmm. to him at some point and see if I can see what other people are seeing. But it's a pretty deep corner class. I think the Steelers will draft one of their top three picks probably. But we'll see what they do in free agency first. And, and I still don't really know if I have a good feel for uh, the order of operations there. Uh, the other one that's really interesting, and, and it's not – about the combine, like it's not about the running, right? It's certainly not about the running, um, but maybe more about just like talking to these guys. The defensive tackles, I, I really don't know. Like, I was going to mention, I want to know what the buzz about around Tavondre Sweat specifically is well, so going like, to be. After one of the things that we'll learn is so each team gets 40 formal interviews 
and they mm-hmm. can have as many informal interviews as they want. But the formal interviews are like the full sit down, like Omar's there, Mike T's there, Andy Waddle's there. Like it's it's a full, it's a big, big thing. Informal will be like 15 minute session with an assistant coach, right? So like, you know, uh, uh, Pat Meyer might meet with uh, Tanner Bordellini, who's the Wisconsin center, <laughs> right? Okay, like he, he might meet yeah. with him for 10 minutes, right? So like the, clearly the teams are signifying interest with those formal interviews. Like will the Steelers, do formal interviews with these first round defensive tackles because like really Johnny Newton, Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat, Dar- Chris Jenkins, Darius Robinson, Michael Hall, like Braden Fiske. These are all like top three round options for the Steelers that I think make a lot of sense. Uh, are they going to be, are, are they going to show obvious interest in them or not? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, like they don't, have a pressing immediate need at defensive line. Like if they had to play a game today, Cam Hayward, Keanu Benton, Larry Ogunjobi would not be one of their worst position groups. Um, but mm-hmm. it's clear that, you know, like Larry's only there because it's just not feasible to replace him right now. And Cam is, you know, probably a lot closer to the end than the beginning and and not really a long-term part of that process. So where where do the Steelers consider defensive tackle among their own needs? I think that's important. I, I feel very confident that we're going to see them highly involved with tackles, corners, centers in terms of top two round guys. But will defensive tackle be at that level or not? I, I think that's an interesting part of this conversation. And linebacker too, you know, where there aren't very many I would say there's probably only like five linebackers who are going to go before the end of day two, maybe even four. But uh, will they be interested in guys like Jeremiah Trotter, Junior Colson, Peyton Wilson, or will they, you know, maybe go for a later round option um, and, and see how the chips fall? Yeah, the linebackers they bring up was Peyton Wilson. I want to know what the talk about him is going to be like. Those medicals. You want to talk about favorite? I, that guy's one of my favorites, just because he yeah. does. He doesn't fit. He's unique. He's like he doesn't look Did, like any other player. Go go to Br- for Peyton Wilson. I dare you. Like you're not gonna find one. I, I don't. Derek don't mentioned this to me last that. night, though. Dane Brudler brought up Peyton Wilson has six season-ending injuries, going back to his, when he started high school. Yeah, I think that's that's crazy. That, that's like terrifying, and it's and it's, yeah. Um. And it's especially terrifying because you don't have that like body type reference to see like, oh, there's there's a lot of guys that have that have been his size and his speed that have turned out just fine. So he will, too. Like he's he's yeah. one of the kind, man. I I think I really like his tape. I don't know what the league is going to think of him because it's a hard evaluation when you don't look like anybody else. It is it is uh, Alan? Great conversation. We will continue this throughout the week with you at the Combine. Tell the people where they can find you. At A. Saunders underscore PGH, PGH Steelers now. If you happen to be in Indy, you can find me at the bar uh, or the Indiana Convention Center. Uh, hit me up. And uh, hoping to have Omar uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's some mishap with the schedule, so I'm not sure that's going to happen or not. But hopefully we'll be talking to Omar before we talk again on Tuesday. Or say some people might have. I'm glad you cleared that up, and because some people might have construed that as Omar Khan being on the podcast tomorrow. Uh, Listen, that, I'm not, that won't be happening. I'm not saying that's not happening. <laughs> All right, I mean, it's Fair not enough. likely. But like, if yes. I can make it happen, I will. Okay. Good to know. All right. Well, uh, Zachary Smith PGH is where you can find me on all socials. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell here. Hit us in the comments. Any thoughts? questions for tomorrow's show all that good stuff you guys know leave us a five-star review if you're listening somewhere else apple spotify wherever you get your podcast from for alan saunders and myself thanks for jumping in take another ride on the steelers afternoon drive (laughs) 